Hi there, everybody. We're getting Chris Tao on the line from Pierce Conservation District. There he is. Excellent. Hi, Chris. Hi, Stina. All right. I think um, we have some lovely folks helping us today do a little exciting collaboration between Harbor Wild Watch and Pierce Conservation District. We have Rachel on the Facebook page answering questions and Charlie Fester running Tech From Home uh, doing a live stream of a Zoom meeting so we can have both of us here today. Uh, Carly, are we good to go? We should be good to go. Hi, everyone. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everybody to today's online learning activity. I'm Stina Troyer, the science specialist with Harbor Wild Watch, and we are so excited to be collaborating with Chris from the Pierce Conservation District here today. And um, as always, we like to know where are you tuning in from? So um, if you could write in our comment stream uh, where you're tuning in from and what grade your students are who are joining us today, that would be fabulous. So uh, let's see, what are, what are we learning about today, Chris? Today, we're gonna be looking at macroinvertebrates, which are creatures that live in streams and rivers and ponds. And so we're gonna be seeing some of them uh, live and up close that you collected and learning about why they're important, like why we dug them out today and why we're going to be looking at them. Awesome. So I know with streams, we can do a lot of different things to test water quality. Uh, we could make this a lesson on chemistry, but it's kind of hard to get all the equipment to those of you at home in your living rooms. So while we'd love to take the temperature of the creek with you, maybe look at the turbidity, which is like the amount of uh, stuff in the water. Is it cloudy? Is it clear? We could look at the pH or the acidity or basicness of our creek. Uh, we could look at nitrates um, or how much nutrients are in the water. Uh, we could all, do all sorts of chemistry tests. But as Chris mentioned, today we're going to be looking at the macro invertebrates. And that means basically macro is things you can see with your naked eye. Um, so you don't need a microscope. We, we're not calling them microinvertebrates, macroinvertebrates. And invertebrate means animals with no backbone. So pretty much big bugs you can see. Would you agree with that, Chris? <laughs> I would very much agree with that. You're very right. So they're going to be things like insects and uh, worms and crustaceans, all sorts of different things in this category. Awesome. So today, um, I popped over to Donkey Creek here in Gig Harbor, Washington, and I went out and collected some different macroinvertebrates. Um, some of them were swimming, some of them were stuck to rocks, and today we get to make some predictions about what these macroinvertebrates are going to tell us for the health of this particular stream that we see today. Um, I know we have some critter cards shared online, so you're welcome to get those out. Um, feel free to do some drawings of some of the things that you see today. And of course, as a good scientist, make a prediction about what these macroinvertebrates can tell us about the health of a stream. So Chris, I'm wondering if you could, can you explain a little bit more about how we can use macroinvertebrates as a way to um, tell if a creek is healthy or not? Yeah, definitely. So they are an indicator of stream health which means they can tell us how clean or how polluted the water is. And that's because they're categorized into different pollution tolerance levels. So some can tolerate uh, water when it gets dirty or low oxygen levels, and some can't, they're sensitive to pollution. So they need really high oxygen levels and clean water. So if we can identify the macroinvertebrates and figure out which pollution cate category they're in, we can collect that data and see what it tells us about the health of the stream. We want to find more of the sensitive ones and fewer of the tolerant ones. So in this stream, we'll see if we're finding more of one kind or the other. Awesome. That sounds like a plan. So uh, what I've done today is first I took most of this stuff from a nice bucket. I went out with a net and just kind of collected some things that were in the water and then started sorting them out for uh, ease of viewing and hopefully we'll get a nice good look uh, with my phone. But I noticed we have this little guy crawling over here um, on the edge of the tank. Uh, do you have any idea what that could be? 
Yeah, looking at that one, that looks like it's a black fly larva. And the way I've heard this one described is that it looks like a bowling pin. So up close, does that kind of look like a bowling pin to you? Oh, yeah, I, I definitely can get a better look at it than you can with my phone. But I noticed it looks like it has like a, a suction cup kind of butt <laughs> and then it's waving around in the water. Maybe I think it might be saying hi to you or maybe it's saying hi to everybody else who's tuning in. Everybody wave at the black fly larva. Cool. Oh, look, it's inching around. Yeah. Uh, that's so what, nice. Where does the black fly larva fall as an indicator for stream health? So that's a tolerant organism. So that one is gonna fare better and do better when there's less movement in the water and less oxygen, maybe not quite as healthy. So that would be an example of a, a pollution tolerant organism. Doesn't mean automatically that the stream is bad because uh, we haven't you know, seen the other things yet, but if we saw a stream just full of these and that's it, then that would be a bad sign. I was gonna about to say, uh-oh and be worried for the health of Donkey Creek here, but it sounds like we're gonna have to keep investigating and making some more observations. All right, let's see. What else have we got here? How about, uh, how about this one over here? Mm, yeah, so I don't see any legs on that one. Is that missing, uh, missing any legs? Yeah, yeah. Kind of looks like it's very worm-like kind of squiggling around. Hopefully you can see that wiggle between all the little, there's looks like there's some sand in this one as well, but uh, would this be an aquatic worm? Yeah, that looks like an aquatic worm to me. So kind of like the worms you would see crawling around your garden or in the dirt. Um, there's an aquatic version too. So that's what that one looks like to me. And that one again is a pollution tolerant organism. So in that same category as the black fly larva we just saw. Hmm, interesting. Now I noticed I, a little movement over here caught my eye. We have some little fish that we found in the creek today. It looks like, I think I have a pair of sculpin. How do sculpin rate as a indicator of good water quality in a stream? Sculpin, they're in the middle, so they're somewhat tolerant, so they can handle a little bit more pollution than some of the sensitive ones that I hope we'll get to. Um, so we're starting to get a little bit, a little bit better. Hopefully we see more in that category and the sensitive category. Excellent. I really like how well this sculpin just blends in with this creek material. Um, I also know a lot of sculpin are saltwater species, and uh, that might be a good clue that Donkey Creek uh, connects out to the estuary. So here's another one in the corner. Uh, if anybody decides to draw a picture of this cute little sculpin, maybe you can send that our way. Let's see if we can. Oops. <laughs> ah, where are we going? Uh, hard to see. Okay, I was able to get a couple other creatures out of this bin, and hopefully we can make some observations about them. But let's start with some of these rocks. Um, I notice these rocks, it looks like there's other rocks, oops, sorry, <laughs> glued to them. Kind of like here, it's like some leafy, rocky sort of material. Let me get a good, sorry about that. There we go. Um, maybe I can find another example on this other rock. Yeah. I would guess they kind of look like stones glued together, which reminds me of the caddisfly. I think that could be a caddisfly casing. Yeah, yeah. When you talk about rocks or sand or sometimes even blades of grass uh, stuck together, that's a good sign that it's a caddisfly larva, which I think personally is one of my favorite macroinvertebrates because they make such cool cases out of the stream bed materials. And so they actually build themselves a home and use that for protection from, from predators or from the stream current. Uh, but caddisflies are definitely one of one of my favorites to find. Cool. Um, where's my hand finger? <laughs> There's kind of that rock casing. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, that's a pretty clever way. I wonder if people at home are are being clever like the caddisfly and making up their own little versions of <laughs> forts using the things around their house. Um, I also peeked over here. It's like 
there's ah, a little squiggly guy. Uh, it's kind of, the glare is tricky. Oop. What do you think that is? Mm, that's a good question. But uh, I definitely notice how um, these are, like you saw the black fly larva earlier, they're really good at clinging and sticking to things. Because imagine being in a fast moving stream or river, they have to attach themselves, otherwise they're going to get washed away. So a lot of these will have strategies to suction themselves or little claws to cling on to rocks and logs and stuff. So that's look like that's what that one is doing. Nice. Um, I just caught this little friend using a pipette. Uh, I'm going to stick it in a nice little hole here. There we go. Here we go. Give it a little more water. Oops, wrong one. I noticed this one has a nice little, <laughs> sorry, this is, which hole did I put it in? That one. Okay. <laughs> there it is. Technical difficulties over here. And then let me move around so my shadow's off of it. Uh, we almost need this one. It looks like it has a nice little fanned tail. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that one, and I think in the, the slot next to it too, I think you have mayflies there. All right. Yeah, I see this one. Three prongs. They kind of look, I like the stripiness of the one on the left. Um, and then, oh, there's another little one swimming. So yeah, you can count uh, the number of little tail prongs. Uh, we could call them. Some have two and some have three. What's up with that? Yeah, so when we group things into mayflies um, or caddisflies, those are those are groups. So we would get even more specific and go into species if we could, since there's multiple species in each of those groups. And so they have um, different different features that might help us tell them apart, like how their tails look, how their bodies are colored, or sometimes where their gills are. You know, you were talking about putting more water in the bucket there, because these have, especially mayflies, have gills on the sides of their abdomen. And so if you look really close, they might start moving those gills to get more circulation. So that way they can get oxygen into their bodies because this water isn't moving that much right now. And so they might take it upon themselves to help get more oxygen into their body. You can give them another little squirt here. I noticed this over in this um, one, there's a pretty active little guy with three little tail fronds. So was swimming up and down. Um, there's also this one over here. Uh, where's my finger? <laughs> I noticed this one very clearly has the two prongs. Um, so the stone fly, I think, has the two. Whereas, uh, this one over here has three. So two nice examples of that. And then a nice caddis fly right in the middle. Um, so since we're seeing a lot of these, what, what would that help us make a prediction about the health of Donkey Creek here? That's definitely a good sign to see more of those because both mayflies uh, and stoneflies, as well as the caddis fly we're looking at, those are all sensitive organisms. So they prefer really clean water with lots of oxygen and lots of um, vegetation, leaves in the stream. So that would suggest, you know, there's trees and plants along it to give it shade and also a food source. So this is kind of suggesting that we're uh, looking at a healthier stream as we're seeing more and more of these organisms. Awesome. Um, I know as uh, someone who has lots of friends who like to go fishing, it sounds like fishermen like to use ties that mimic mayflies. Um, they have a very short lifespan. They only live 24 hours in their adult phase. Um, and they're very tasty to fish. Of course, they know the little nymphs or the aquatic larvae, they can survive for a long time in the water. So more like, I don't know, it's like years. Years, then, three years or more. Short <laughs> adult phase. Um, yeah, so we're, we're basically looking at babies or teenagers right now of these insect larvae. So like you were saying, they're going to hatch into adults at some point if they're lucky. And uh, that's why you're saying people who fly fish use them as as lures to make it look like 
a fly is landing on top of the water. So a fish, maybe even a salmon, because these are really preferred food source for salmon, um, juvenile salmon especially, uh, they're going to be a really important food source as juvenile salmon make their way from the creeks and rivers out to Puget Sound and eventually the ocean. Nice. Um, the kind of that life cycle reminds me of another animal where they're having the babies in the aquatic habitat, so in the water, and then the adults are on land. I wonder if in the comments, can anybody think of another animal that has a similar life cycle? Ribbit. <laughs> you may have guessed a frog. Good hint. Um, I know, uh, Chris, what does a caddisfly sound like? Do they make any noises? Uh, I can't think of any any noises that they that I. Uh, this was just my opportunity to make you make some funny sounds um, online. Yeah, I, I would like to venture a guess, but I just didn't know <laughs> where to start for sure. Yeah, um, I definitely noticed when I was collecting, there was a lot of stuff living on the rocks as well as like woody debris. Um, at this point, I think I've disturbed disturbed them enough that oh, there's one, very tiny. <laughs> Crawling around, you kind of see it moving. Uh, it looks like it has two prongs, so that would be a stonefly. Um, but it seemed like they liked that woody debris to hang out on. Yeah, okay. definitely. Cool. Gonna have their food source and also something to cling to. Yeah. Uh, another way I tell mayflies and stoneflies apart is mayflies tend to kind of swim or flutter around and stoneflies uh, they they crawl around a little bit more, crawl around the rock. So sometimes just by looking at how they move is kind of my first clue to telling them apart. Nice. So it sounds like you have a lot of experience with this kind of stuff, Chris. Uh, can you tell us more about maybe some opportunities people have to get involved and learn more about these kind of things with you? Yeah, well, I work at the Conservation District, and so we work to uh, protect water quality and water resources around Pierce County. So a big way to get involved is to volunteer for stream habitat projects. So on weekends, often we'll have plantings where volunteers can come out and put trees and native plants along these streams. Because like we were saying earlier, uh, we need to keep water temperatures cool and we need woody debris in the streams. And so restoring a stream that may not have much um, shade and not much buffer or plants around it is a great way to kind of help make a difference and improve the habitats for these macroinvertebrates. And then of course the salmon who, who we all really care about and getting our salmon numbers back up. So volunteer plantings are a great way to get involved. We also um, recruit volunteers to water monitoring. So you were talking about testing the chemical quality of streams earlier, um, we'll have volunteers go out and collect that data. And so we'll kind of have a picture of how streams are doing and if they're if they're in trouble or not. So we just want to get people involved and learn more about it. Um, and then actually, you know, put that learning into action and improving some of the habitats around us. Awesome. Where could I find more information about that, Chris? So we're active on Facebook right now. Um, we are trying to put out resources, um, especially learning resources, since families are home right now and looking for um, activities and projects and more information about these things. So we're posting, you know, home projects and online learning resources to get to get people looking at them. And then, you know, once things kind of return a little bit more back to how they were. Um, our Facebook page and our website are going to have all those events and workshops posted so people can find one that works for them. Awesome. That is super exciting. Well, I definitely think we got to see quite a lot of pretty amazing creatures today. Um, I know I plan on taking them all back to Donkey Creek. So um, can we make any firm or conclusions about the healthy health of Donkey Creek or what, what would be some more information we'd need? Um, to make that uh, statement that Donkey Creek is indeed healthy. Yeah, so to be, you know, a scientifically accurate result, we would need to count 500 of these organisms. 500? Oh my gosh. Yeah, you might have to keep going the rest of the day, but let us know what you find. 
oh boy, it sounds like I'm going to be pretty, pretty busy here. <laughs> um, uh, I wonder, um, so if people have creeks near them, um, is this something that you could observe in your own creek or um, how could somebody go about seeing if their creek is healthy? Yeah, so a lot of streams, uh, especially in Pierce County, actually receive a grade. And so if you Ooh. have a Pierce County report card, there's um, years going back of the grades of different streams. So you can see how healthy your local stream is. And then like you mentioned, you can just take a visit to your local creek or pond or lake. And just by observing up close, you might start to see some of these and the more you learn which ones are which, the better idea you have of how clean or how polluted that water might be. Awesome. That is some pretty exciting stuff today. Um, I know we're going to continue doing our best to answer more questions or comments um, in the Facebook thread. Uh, if we don't get back to you, feel free to shoot us a message. I'm sure we can uh, help plug you in, um, get you involved with uh, kind of like a string team, making sure uh, these places are happy and healthy and um, definitely want to thank you Chris a lot for uh, joining us today it definitely makes <laughs> these adventures more fun when you can um, add some experts on stream ecology to the mix uh, there's some lots to learn um, even just in these tiny little buckets here it'd be pretty exciting to go out to the creek um, and see this stuff firsthand so uh, we definitely look forward to doing that, hopefully in the new, near future. Um, but for all of you, you staying home and staying safe, um, that is definitely appreciated during this time. And uh, we're excited to continue offering free online workshops that you can tune into every week. And um, that's on Thursdays and Mondays with Harbor Wild Watch. And Chris, we look forward to doing some more of this awesome, cool collaborating with you. Yeah, that thanks for having me. I had, I had fun. Yeah, um, and uh, anything else you want to say for Pierce Conservation District? Yeah, just check us out. You know, when the time comes to start getting out again and you feel like you want to burn some energy planting some trees or working on some pollution prevention projects, I'm sure we can find something for you. Cool. Well, thank you again, Chris, and thanks for all of you who tuned in. Uh, we are so delighted to be a resource for you during this time. And, um, I know as Harbor Wild Watch continues to do online education, um, you're welcome to check that out. We appreciate you following us on Facebook or uh, Instagram, all that social media good stuff. Um, shoot us a like, tag, give us some questions. We love answering questions. Um, and of course, if you, it's not required, but if you feel inspired, uh, we definitely appreciate donations through our Harbor Wild Watch website. And um, we just look forward to continue offering fun opportunities for you to learn and have fun. So. With that, I think uh, that's a wrap. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.